I know. So we're looking at this one. This is 2010. This is a classic type problem. They love to give you data. And so here's this. And the first thing is part A is strictly saying calculate delta T. Well, delta T is always what minus what? Final minus initial. T final minus P initial. And this year, several of my students missed this because of a simple, I mean, obviously the difference is going to be 21.8 to 25, okay? So that's gonna be 3.2 degrees. But it's gotta be T final minus T initial, so it's gotta be 21.8 minus the 25. So it's gonna equal negative 3.2 degrees Celsius. Okay? <laughs> would it be... Some of my students might have missed it this year too. <laughs> would, um, would it be three or, well, would you go to the hundredths place or tenths? Just tenths. This is tenths place. Because this is tenths place here, you can't, you, on a graph like this, you're at 25.0. They're already kind of telling you the sig fix. Okay. Okay? All right. So here, so it's right on this line, so I know it's going to be 21.8. There was another one like this, right? Yeah, on the, it's going the other direction. And it's funny because I was like, oh, wow, they're probably going to trick us, which was final and initial. And then they this one. <laughs> okay, you were right. <laughs> Okay, so it's real straightforward. Then B just asks, is it endor and exothermic then? Well, since the solution's getting cold, we know that the reaction is endothermic. endothermic. Okay, so that, that should be easy money. That should be low-lying fruit. Those should be easy points right there for you. Okay, nothing challenging on that math. Now, when we go up here, it says... Assume the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter is negligible and the specific heat capacity of the solution of water is 4.2. Calculate the heat of dissolution and then calculate the molar enthalpy. What does it mean, molar enthalpy? What are the units going to be on molar enthalpy? So what? Kilojoules per mole, which is what we just did. Calculate the delta H in joules or kilojoules and then using the data, figure out kilojoules per mole. So this problem right here is identical to the calorimetry problem we just did. Okay? So we have to just look at the information that's given. We now know that I'm looking for delta H of the reaction. So this is what's given here. I know that I have 5.13 grams of the solid. I'm putting it into 91.95 grams of water. So since I'm dissolving it into it, it's, it's a coffee cup calorimeter. So it's not a bomb calorimeter. So what do I do with those masses? Add them. Okay. So my delta H of the reaction is going to equal the mass, which is 91.95 grams plus the 5.13 grams. Specific heat, they say, assume it's going to be, didn't they say 4.2? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, assume it's 4.2, given in the problem down there in C. And we already figured that the change in temperature is 3.2 degrees Celsius. So when you do all of that out, what do we get for delta H? And this, by the way, is a negative. Negative one point, uh, positive 1.3 kilojoules. Now, it does not specify what unit you have to have delta H in. So you could have said joules or kilojoules. However, you must have a unit on it. If you just put 1.3, you don't get credit because you have to identify whether it's joules or kilojoules. Okay, so you have to put the unit on it. Now, how then, so this is C1. How then do we get kilojoules per mole? So it's one, so delta H is equal to 1.3 kilojoules divided by what? How much do we dissolve? What mass do I use? 5.13 grams. And if I, if it wanted kilojoules per gram, I would just stop there. How do I go to moles? times the molar mass of the quinone, or urea, I mean. They use urea a ton. 
So it's got to be 2 times 14 is 28, plus 12 makes 40, 44 plus 16 makes 60. 60.06. 60.06. That's going to equal, and it's positive. Uh, 15. 15? Does everybody agree with that number? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Does anyone want to double check it? Sure. 1.3 divided by 5.13 times 60. Now, while he's doing that, we very easily could have just gone 5.13 divided by the 60, gotten moles, and then divided moles into the 1.3. Okay? Exact same problem that we just did in the book. So don't overthink them. Don't try and make them more difficult than they are. I mean, they're just going through step by step, calculating, doing the exact same thing. Be real comfortable with the terminology. All right, we had to skip D on this one, but let's look at E and F. E is nothing more than a math question. The student repeats the experiment. This time the delta H is 11% below the accepted value, okay? And that they give, give you a Delta H, the accepted value is 14. Okay? So it says that it's 11% um, below the accepted value. So how do I do that? You can multiply 14 by 89%. Okay. Because <laughs> um, it's got to be 89%, or what's a separate way, another way we can do it? So we can go 14 grams times 0.89 equals. Or, what can we say? If you did 14 grams times 0.11, will we add it? And subtract. You would subtract that then from the 14. Yeah. That's okay. Right. So what's 14 times 0.11? 1.54. What is it? 1.54. 1.54. So that's, how, that's your error. Okay? So it's going to be 14 minus 1.54 which is going to equal 12.46 kilojoules per mole. Now, what do we get 14 times 0 0.89? 12.46. 12 Either way is the right way. Okay? This is just a math question, though. It's just a percent question. And then lastly, the student performs a third trial experiment, but this time adds the urea that has been taken directly from a refrigerator at five. Okay? What effect of any would using the cold urea instead of the 25 have on the experimentally obtained value of delta H? Well, remember that the experimental value delta H was equal to negative mass times specific heat times change in temperature. What value is going to be affected by this? change in temperature. The mass isn't going to change at all. The specific heat's not changing. But this time, you're putting an ice cube in. So you're starting at 25 degrees. The water's at 25 degrees. But now you're going to put in the urea. It's going to all do the reaction. But it's also then going to be cold to start with. So what's that going to do to this solution, to the, my final temperature? It's going to be, it's going to be even colder, right? It's going to be down in here. So if delta T is bigger, if delta T gets bigger, what's that going to do to my delta H? Make it bigger. That's how you kind of think through these last what if, what error, what how would this affect it? What is what value in our calculation is it going to change? It's going to make it go up, make it go down, and then what's that going to do to my final answer? Yes, sir. I need to check out. Okay. You can watch the rest, because I know you won't want to miss it. I'll be sure to watch it. <laughs> and feel free to subscribe to my channel.
All right. Anybody have any questions on that one? Did we get it all right? No. No? <laughs> all right. So the next one was 2016. 15. 15. Where? 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 <laughs> I saw a meme. I saw a meme that said, "This is a perfect time to get braces." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody will see your smile. And I forgot to take one of my English class, so I'm just gonna turn around and pull it and look out. Nice. Yeah. Did I? Oh. They'll never know. No, I tried to make my hair cover up most of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. Then there were two. You don't have basketball, do you? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this morning probably, right? That's why she's so tired. Well, what time do you get here? What? What time do you get here for basketball? Um, practice starts at 6.30. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't wake up till 7.30. I know. That'd be rough. Oh, my God. Crawl That's out of bed and have to run and get all fired up like that. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.
we're going to have to just use this that's per mole rather than joules per gram, which is what it normally is. Okay, this is the molar versus the specific heat capacity. All right, so again, if we're looking at our heating curve, we take the solid, we have to melt it, then we bring it to, through a liquid, then we boil it, then it goes up again. So this is temperature. This is going to be your kilojoules, your heat added. So if we want to melt the aluminum, okay, it's at 298. We have to heat it up from 298 up to 933. But once it gets to 933, we still have to add in that heat of fusion, okay? The heat of fusion of 10.7 kilojoules per mole is the amount that it's going to take to go from solid to liquid. Will that always be given? Yes. Okay. okay. So we have two Qs. We did, this was the very first type of problem that we did. Uh, I, I showed you with, um, you know, heats of reaction. We did the, all the different Qs. Okay. So my delta H of the reaction is going to equal Q of the solid going from 278, no, it's not degrees, it's K, up to uh, 933 K plus the Q melt using my heat of fusion. So those two Qs, those are the two things we have to measure. So whenever we have a phase change, whenever they're talking about melting, we have to be thinking about this type of graph. So when there's a temperature change, it's gonna equal MC delta T. So I got one mole, okay? And since we're given the molar heat, I can just use this, and I don't have to. I don't have to use mass. I can use moles. So I'm going to say one mole times 24 joules per mole K times my change in temperature. Well, what's 933 minus 270? 298. 933 minus 298. 635. 635 K. That's my delta T plus my one mole times 10.7 kilojoules per mole. My heat of fusion. So it's really just going to be 24 times 635 plus 10.7. So delta H is going to equal, just do that, 20, so I'm going to do, do a new calculator, 24 times 635 Fifteen thousand two hundred kilojoule, two hundred. Well, with sig figs, we really want three sig figs. Or two for the twenty-four. Yeah, really, the twenty-four is going to give us two. So we're really just going to say fifteen thousand, and that's kilojoules. Oh well, no, that's is, is, that's, that's, that's joules. joules. Ah, look here, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. What's the problem? The um, heat of fusion is in kilojoules. That's right. It's... We have joules and we have kilojoules. Uh -huh. Okay? So I think that it's going to be easier since we already have that there. Okay? This just is going to, what would this be in joules? 10.7 kilojoules is going to be? 10,700. 10,700 joules per mole. Okay, or you can just make this 0 0.024 kilojoules, either way. Okay, but the, these two things have to match up. That was a trick. And okay, that's got to pay attention to units. It's AP being a pain. So now it's 24 times 635 plus 10,700.
25,940 joules, okay, is how much energy you'd have to put in, which is 25, really we'll just round that to 26 kilojoules. Okay, so 26 kilojoules just to melt one mole of aluminum. Now part B says the equation for the overall process of extracting aluminum from Al2O3. By the way, um, shoot, what, uh, my brain, um, I know what this is. Oh, bauxite. Okay, just a little side note, trivia note. When I moved to Baton Rouge, they told me, oh, look, when you get to this part of town, you can see right here, there's an army ammunition um, uh, plant right here. Okay, it's on army ammunition. I don't know if they called it a dump or whatever, but uh, it was a storage facility for army ammunition. They cool. said, oh man, cool. And these, you could see these big mounds that were covered in grass to kind of, you know, camouflage them and all that. Um, I said, man, oh, they got guns, they got bazookas, they got, you know, all kinds of good stuff on the day. I wish I could get in there, you know, whatever. But then it turns out it's bauxite. They just have it buried. Because in order for us to be able to produce aluminum, we need this as a starting material, and most of it is mined out of Russia. And so if we ever went to war with Russia, they were gonna they would stop supplying us with the bauxite, and then we wouldn't have aluminum to make the war machine. So it's so they stockpile. It's a bauxite reserve. It's a bauxite reserve to be able to make pure aluminum, so we could, you know, make all the things that we make out of aluminum. That's cool. Okay. It's cool, but it was also very boring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very disappointing. Very much of a letdown. All right. So, but the equation for that is extracting aluminum from bauxite. That's the name of that mineral, uh, which requires less energy: recycling existing aluminum or extracting aluminum from the Al two O three. Well, we have 1675 kilojoules per mole reaction, right? So we have, this is 26 kilojoules for every mole of aluminum, right? Because we said we had one mole. So that's for one mole. How do we get this value? That's for two moles. This is 1675 kilojoules and I'm not sure on that number. Um, I think we need another zero or something. 1675 kilojoules per two moles of aluminum, which is gonna equal 837.5 yes. kilojoules. Okay? Well, maybe that's right. Are we 100% sure that this number's right? Did you double 99. check it? No, did you just double check this? 24 times 635 plus 10,700. Yep. Okay? So. Man, that's a pretty big difference. <laughs> it takes 837 kilojoules per mole of aluminum to purify it from a bauxite. Whereas it takes 26 kilojoules per mole just to melt it and recycle it. Okay? A lot less energy to recycle than to purify. So don't throw your cans in the trash. You can really save a lot of energy by recycling. That's one of the few things that really is beneficial on the recycling. A lot of the Plastics and the other things that we recycle aren't recycled the right way. They can't really all be used. A lot of them still end up in the landfill. But cans can always be recycled. Okay? And this is even a more concentrated form of the aluminum using the, the pop tops, which is why they do fundraisers with yeah, these. Because you can, they can get more money because for this because it's more concentrated. It's a denser aluminum than um, the can. All right. So that's... 2015, quick and easy. This would be a four point question, okay? It'd be two and, uh, it might be a three and a one, but it's probably a two and a two, okay? 
as far as this is so in the modern day which is, this is one of the current formats you have seven problems the first three are considered long and expect you to take around 20 minutes to do those each or total 20 minutes to each then you have four short problems which are just going to be an a and a b or a b and c which are much shorter and they're expected to do those in about seven to eight minutes Okay, you have 105 minutes total. Okay, that's a little, it's an hour and 45. So if you spend an hour on the first, that gives you an hour basically, another 45 minutes to do the four short ones. Okay, but this would this is what this would be a short one. And if you knew what you were doing on this one, you can get this one done in five minutes. All right. So now we can go to 16. 16, we've already answered many parts of it. Okay? But once again, I look at the very beginning of this and I see the word calorimeter. So what type of problem do I think this is going to be? Calorimetry. A calorimeter problem. Okay? In addition to the salts, the student has access to a calorimeter, a balance with a precision of plus or minus 0.1 and a thermometer with a precision of plus or minus 0.1, okay? So that means precision plus or minus, that means it measures to, to the nearest 0.1. It really is telling me, okay, I can go to the 10th place here, I can go to the 10th place there. That's what that means. And there's a specific heat question at the very end, of the, I mean, a, a significant figures question at the very end. So calculate the magnitude of the heat absorbed Notice that word, by the solution. That's going to be the positive value. Then we're going to go delta H, which is going to be just put the negative sign on. Okay? So it's heat absorbed is positive. Determine delta H is going to be the negative. So, again, I know. Let's just go ahead and come over here. Delta H, this is going to be A, 1. Delta H is going to equal m negative mc delta t. So the mass, what's the mass going to be? Okay, 110 grams. And that's three sig figs, because, well, this is 100.0. We can actually go to 110.0. Specific heat, they're going to, they give you, either, uh, they're assuming, a, uh, oh, they're telling us right here, the heat capacity is 4.18. And then my change in temperature, okay, 15 to 35.6, so it's going to be what? 20.6. 20.6. Okay, so my delta H is going to equal... All of that multiplied, it's going to equal what? Negative 900, no, 9,470. And that's going to be joules. Grams canceled, degrees Celsius canceled. Notice it says also include units with your answer. Make sure you read the problem. Now, determine the value in terms of kilojoules per mole. Well, this is just like the problems, again, we just did. There's only so many ways we can do this. So, kilojoules per mole, we're going to take negative 900, well, let's go delta H equals negative 9470. Well, we can even go to kilojoules easily because that's going to be how many kilojoules? Uh, 9.4. 9.4, right? If we're going to do two sig figs. Well, we have, why, why would we do two? We have four, three, and three. Let's say 9.47 kilojoules divided by what? Um, oh, you would, you would use the grams LICL that we have. Which is? Uh, 10. 10 grams. And then use the molar mass to go to moles. And then multiply by the molar mass. It's 35.45 plus 6.93. 42.35, that one you got? Yeah. 
So it's the exact same problem that this is like the third or fourth one we've done like this, where you calculate delta H first. Now, but I didn't, I, I made a comment about it. We want the, the question says, well, how much is the heat absorbed? What's the sign going to be for the heat absorbed? This is going to be positive. But then we, when we go to delta H, the heat of the reaction is going to be the negative. Okay? Now, I don't think they would have marked off if you put the negative sign, um, but uh, it's, it's asking for the amount absorbed. Okay? And what does this value end up equal? Negative 40.1 kilojoules per mole. Yep. Okay. Now, the rest of it, that's really the part that I want you to do, but there's the, the part at the end too. But I said, well, this, this middle part will be a good review, we, even though we've already done it. Uh, I think a couple guys in the other class said, yeah, I just looked back at my notes when, you know, and copied. <laughs> okay, to explain why delta H for NaCl is different than that of LiCl, investigates the factors that affect delta H of solution and finds the ionic radius and lattice enthalpy, Coulomb's law, can be defined as delta as the delta H associated with the separation of a solid crystal into gaseous ions. Contribute to the process. The student consults references. So we have 76 and 102. So remember that delta H is equal to K times Q plus times, or Q minus, I don't know if I use Q or N, over D. Q is the charge. You can use N as the charge. Okay, it doesn't matter. Use X. Okay? But we know the product of the charges, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, they're the same. So what's the factor? The distance. The bigger it is, the weaker. the weaker the attraction, the lower the melting point. So this is here. So then we got to go to the actual question. The actual question says then write the complete electron configuration for an Na plus. That's going to be. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Sodium would be 3s1, Na, but they want Na plus, so what's it going to be? Just 2p6. Just, just 2p6. Okay? Half my students missed that because they put sodium, they went to 3s1. I got the pink book, so I, I wanted to go, they're lucky they graduated, so I want to slap them. Okay? I wouldn't do it because I like my job, but they needed to be slapped. Using the principles of atomic structure, explain why Na plus is larger than Li plus. Why is Na plus larger? It's got more energy levels, okay? Now, it's Na plus, so Na has three energy levels, but Na plus has lost that third one, so Na plus has two energy levels, whereas Li plus only has one energy level. More energy levels makes larger ion. Okay, so just kind of pay attention. Know oh, again that this is this is the equivalent of neon. That's the equivalent of helium. Which salt has the greater lattice enthalpy? Well, we just did find that earlier. Lithium is going to have the greater lattice because it's got a smaller ion, and according to Coulomb's law, the, the closer the distance, the smaller the distance, the greater the lattice energy is going to be. And then below is the representation. Now again, we have Na plus and Cl minus. Now uh, look at where they're, uh, pardon me, this is LiCl. Look at where they're located on the periodic table. Let's go ahead and shine it up here. You have Li plus, which means it's going to lose one electron. It's going to be isoelectronic with helium. Cl minus is going to gain an electron and be isoelectronic with argon. So obviously, which one's the big one? Cl minus, okay, don't miss this, okay? So this is going to be Cl minus, this is going to be Li plus, 
It's just periodic training. It's just that that is such an easy money point right there. You got a 50-50 chance just to guess. But that just should be so obvious. You ought to be, that one ought to be almost embarrassingly easy. But unfortunately it wasn't. All right, so now the lattice enthalpy of LiCl is positive, indicating that it takes energy to break the ions apart. However, the dissolution of LiCl in water is exothermic. Identify all the property particle particle interactions that contribute significantly to the dissolution. Now, what are the three steps of the dissolving process? Solvent to solvent. Solute to solute. Solvent to solvent. Solvent to solvent. solvent, to solvent. Solute to solvent. The first two are endo or exothermic. Endothermic. Requiring energy. The third one is when bonds form, it's the exothermic one. So it's the one, the, the process being exothermic. It's the attraction of water plus the Li plus and water plus the Cl minus. That energy of hydration. What do we call the attraction of an ion to, to water? It's the ion dipole attraction. Now the key is that you have to mention both of them to get credit on this question. For each, notice it says for each interaction, well the interaction is Li plus in water, the interaction is Cl minus in water. They're two separate because they're dissociated. So you gotta mention them both, okay? and the specific type of intermolecular force between those particles. So you would say, for each interaction, include the particles that interact. Lithium will be attracted to water by strong ion to dipole attractions, and the chloride ion will be attracted to water also by ion to dipole attractions. They don't want you to do anything as far as explaining why it's exothermic or any of that. It just says, uh, identify the particle-particle interactions that contribute. This is what they're looking for. Okay, so don't get off on other, don't start explaining things that the question doesn't ask for. All right, so that's 16. 18. We got one left, 18. Let's see if I can find it. Where is 18? Where's 18, huh? Why don't I have an 18? Right here. Oh, no, that's the same one. That's the same one. second part of this one. This is the first part.
All right, so we have another graph, another temperature change. So it says the solutions, all originally at 20 degrees, are combined in an insulated calorimeter. Okay, so that's a clue right there, the type of problem again. The temperature of the reaction mixture is shown. So this time, what's delta T going to be? Positive or negative? What is the temperature change? It's delta T. Uh, Delta T is going to be final. What would we say? This this is 32, this is 33, so what would we say this is? 32.5. 32.5. And you're going to have a, a lot of latitude on that one, minus 20 degrees. So our, our change in temperature is 12.5 degrees. Okay? It's going to be positive this time because it's going up. It says the mass of the reaction mixture inside the calorimeter is 15.21. Calculate the magnitude of the heat energy that is released during the reaction. Now, it is saying released. So you aren't going to necessarily have to have the negative sign. But it's unheard to put it. Okay? Because we know that it's an exothermic reaction. It says, assume that the specific heat of the reaction mixture is 3.94 and the heat absorbed by the calorimeter is negligible. So again, what equation are we going to use here in order to calculate delta H? MK. Negative mass. The mass of the solution is given directly. It's 15.21 grams. Specific heat is given as 3.94 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And we calculated the change in temperature is 12.5 degrees. So we plug all that in. Okay, 7.49. Now, is it asking for, uh, calculate the magnitude of the energy in joules, though. It specifically asked for joules. So we need to just say 7,490 joules. It's 749. 749? Mm -hmm. Yep. 7.49. 749 joules. Now, we don't have enough information to go through and do the rest of this one. Okay? Uh, we have to come back to the beginning, and there's some things on there that we haven't learned yet. Uh, so, we'll just kind of stop with that. All right. Well, hold on. So, you have stoichiometry type problem. We have calorimeter type problems. Now notice I went and it was 2015, 2016, 2018. We haven't seen any of the bond energy questions. We haven't seen any of the, uh, the uh, delta H of formations of products minus the delta H of formation of reactants. In the thermochemistry now, they're tending to focus more on the, just the stoichiometry type problems and the calorimeter type problems. So those are the ones that we really need to know. Now we still have to know the other ones, okay? And then we're going to focus on those, um, you know, the, in the end of this week and into next, okay? All right. Now, as much as I would love just to stop right now, we got 20 minutes. So let's talk about chaos. So, if I was to take a piece of magnesium metal and put it into, into acid, it reacts vigorously with the acid at room temperature, bubbles, 
dissolves, gives off hydrogen gas, we can burn the hydrogen gas. But if I take a gold wedding ring and I put it into acid, After this brief message, Okay, so if we want to talk about what causes certain reactions to take place and other ones to not take place, I have some HCl. Whoever made this said ah, it's a combination of three and six molar, so it's somewhere in between there. Still pretty concentrated HCl. As a matter of fact, let's do it inside the graduate. So I have my HCl. And I take a piece of magnesium. Well, magnesium plus HCl, we've done the reaction. Okay? It reacts spontaneously with the oxygen in the air. It's kind of oxidized. But I put it into here and immediately begins to fizzle and bu bubble. It's getting hot. Okay? And I can test the gas that's being given off. Okay? Whoa, okay? That's a, a, a evidence that hydrogen gas is being given off. Okay? That's called the test tube is barking. It's a test tube bark. It's an indication of hydrogen gas. All right? Just do it over and over and over again. Now, I can take this exact same. Now, this is, ooh, feel this, you know, the right here, the 70. It's pretty hot. It's very hot, okay? You want to feel it? <laughs> okay? You saw that I, I just took it out of room temperature, but it's not just warm, it's very hot. Extremely exothermic reaction. Now, if I take that same acid, okay, no tricks up my sleeve, take the same acid, and now it has some of the magnesium ions dissolved in it, and I can take, what do I do with it? I can take, geez, I, I really am not treating this with very much respect at all. Where'd it go? Right there. <laughs> This is the wedding ring for my first marriage. I'm all fired up. <laughs> just thinking about that, I'm just getting rattled. <laughs> okay, but if I take this and I put that into that same acid, 
no bubbles, no reaction, nothing's happening. What is it that causes some things to react and other things not to? Okay, now I can't stick my finger down in there because it's pretty strong acid. That will react. Okay. I don't think it can go down the drain. So the rain is fine. It doesn't dissolve, it doesn't react, it doesn't get pitted. The acid has no effect on it. So sometimes things react and other things don't. There are two driving forces that cause a reaction to occur. Two driving forces. Cause reactions to occur. Okay? We call these sometimes reaction tendencies. It has a tendency to do this. It is a tendency with a Y or an IE? Yeah. Reaction, oh, I'm going to say IE because it's tendencies, not ES. Okay, reaction tendencies. The first one is energy. Reactions always tend to go to a, a lower potential energy. A lower potential energy state. So, a lower potential energy state. What type of reaction, an endothermic or an exothermic, is the product in a lower potential energy state? Exo, because it's giving off energy. Okay, if we look at here, if we look at um, potential energy versus reaction progress, In an exothermic reaction, remember, it looks like this. This is my reactants. These are my products. Remember what we call that? The energy uh, activation. The activation energy, E sub A. But this is my delta H right here, the difference. And it's going to be negative in this case because products have less energy than reactants. Okay, if reactions tend to go to a lower potential energy, that means that nature favors, nature favors exothermic reactions. So the first driving force, the first thing that reactions want to do is get to a lower potential energy. They want to be able to, um, just get to this more stable state. But that's not the only driving force. We've talked a lot about energy. The second driving force is this thing called entropy. And we use delta S to represent changes in entropy. And entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. measure of the disorder of a system. Now, the second law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics is the whole idea of conservation of energy. Q loss equals negative Q gain. The third law of thermodynamics is the whole idea that there's an absolute zero. Okay? The second law of thermodynamics tells us that when things are left to themselves, entropy is going to increase. Nature favors higher entropy. The one thing we know for sure is the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. Constantly increasing. 
some scientists have actually proposed that time is related to entropy. If you're playing and videoing and you see in a video the basketball dropped from a high point of view, it drops, it bounces, it's not going to bounce as high the, you know, as it was originally, and then less and less high until eventually it's just on the ground. Because some of the energy when it hits the ground is converted into friction and vibrational loss converted into heat. So all reactions, and, and the more something is heated up, the more the molecules move faster, the greater the entropy is going to be. And so all reactions eventually just are converted into this useless heat that just goes to speed up molecules and then gets dissipated throughout the entire universe. So scientists have said that we can tell that the movie is playing forwards because the ball is not bouncing as high. If you reverse it and the ball starts going higher and higher, entropy is decreasing and we know we're going back in time. And so it's as entropy increases, so does time. If entropy were to ever decrease, it's hypothesized that time would also decrease. Okay, of the universe. Now, an interesting thought on that was that the universe, we, you know, it's believed the universe is expanding. Okay, the big question. If the universe is constantly expanding, if the universe is everything that we know, and it's expanding, what is it expanding into? <laughs> so there's even more empty space out there. All right, so if it's constantly expanding, what's it expanding into? But some used to think that at some point, gravity was going to slow the expansion and then actually start bringing everything in. So according to scientists, the Big Bang Theory, Okay, which I can kind of deal with because, you know, when God said, let there be light or let there be, you know, I can just imagine, you know, from the light, then let there be light was the first thing. And then from light, all matter was created equals MC squared. I can imagine the big explosion you know, when God said, let there be light. But scientists aren't allowed to use God, so that's not a valid argument. But... All matter started in a very small singularity, is what they say. It exploded, the Big Bang, everything spread out now from that. At some point, gravity is going to catch that and begin bringing it in. If it begins bringing in, that means entropy would begin decreasing instead of increasing, which means possibly time could go in reverse. So we're in a loop. Possibly in a loop, okay? But it seems like then if time is de reversing, then you would be going from old to young. As everything was reversed, which would be kind of crazy. But the good news is, is you would know the mistakes you made as, an, as a young person. And so hopefully then you could correct them as, anyway. Now, that was a little bit debunked because instead of the universe being slowing down as scientists once thought, it's actually been found out that the expansion is speeding up. That somehow or other, the universe is expanding faster and faster and faster, not slower and slower. So and slower. we know it's expanding. We know it's expanding. Okay. All right. So the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. Nature always favors an increase in entropy. So we have two driving forces, two things that want to cause a reaction to occur. We want energy to go down, and we want entropy to go up. Now, they're two completely independent reactions, but they're very much related to one another. Okay? And it all depends upon who wins the battle. And so we end up having this thing called Gibbs free energy. that's delta G and delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S this is your change in energy delta H that's what we've been calculating your enthalpy of your reaction and delta S is going to be the change in entropy now we can calculate delta S
is equal to the sum of your, you don't need a delta, your heats of formation of reactant parmic products minus the sum of your entropies of formation of reactants. Okay, just like delta H, we can calculate delta H products minus reactants. We can calculate delta S, and it's on that same appendix C on page 1100 of the textbook. We can use that exact same one. Okay, so we can calculate delta S easily. Just products minus reactants, multiply by the coefficient, and just subtract, and you get the value. We did several problems like that for delta H. We'll do some more tomorrow with delta S. But delta G is the ultimate determiner. If delta G is negative, the reaction occurs. If delta G is positive, the reaction doesn't occur. If delta G is negative, we say it's thermodynamically favorable. It's spontaneous. It happens. If delta G is positive, it's thermodynamically unfavorable. The reaction doesn't happen. Okay? Ever? Or just... e ever. Okay. As written. So a negative delta G equals spontaneous. A positive delta G is equal to non-spontaneous. So it really just determined, depends upon what's going on. Now, it's kind of like you have two parents. A lot of times y'all are good about working parents against one another. So you say, mom, dad, I got a big test coming up. There's a study session going on. Mr. Holland's gonna be having a study session for his AP chemistry. You know, he's gonna be holding it at Panera Bread. Um, and so it's gonna be from like seven to nine. Is it okay if I go? I would hope that they say yes. Both parents would probably agree that that would be a good idea for you to go to that study session for the big test, okay? On the other hand, so that's like a reaction that lower potential energy and a higher entropy. The one we just did with the magnesium, it got hot, exothermic, right? And a bunch of gas was being given off. Yeah, Gases spread. have high entropy because they've got a lot more chaos, a lot more spread apart. So that was both, both parents were saying yes to this reaction. So it occurred spontaneously all on its own. We didn't have to do anything. There's enough energy at room temperature to make the reaction occur. But what if I said, mom, dad, for spring break, I really want to go to Florida. Okay, I want to go with my boyfriend or girlfriend. Okay, there's going to be a whole group of kids. We're going to be all mixed. Okay, there's probably going to be a lot of drinking and drugs going on. And you know, there's a chance I get pregnant while I'm down there. Um, is it okay if I go? I pray to God that both parents would say no <laughs> to that one, okay? That would be an endothermic reaction whose entropy decreased. Both are negative things. Those reactions will never occur. However, sometimes they're competing. One says yes, one says no. Whichever is stronger. One. Whichever is stronger. That's going to be dependent upon temperature. Those are the temperature-dependent reactions. Some occur at high temperatures, some occur only at low temperatures, but when they're opposing each other, one's a yes and one's a no, then it's gonna be a temperature-dependent reaction, and we'll work on problems like that tomorrow. Now, you 